now and recording and we are good to go so we are live kia ora team and welcome back to oh hey hey they were there too kia ora and welcome everyone who's come in tuned in to week two of our little chats um we got really good feedback from the first one all of all two of our listeners uh gave us some really good feedback and there was a real interest i guess in what people uh wanted to hear from us a lot of people just saying it's good to see the boys back again uh and then there were a few people who just said man that's interesting um i always just thought you guys were the guys with the whistles or you guys just held the clipboards and that's all you did so it's a really nice time to Mm. kind of let people know what we really do but even now we can only give like a little bit of a taste i guess um so as we start to move forward you know we can start to uncover a little bit more about what it is that we really do but then also how it is that we can provide value to other people who are practitioners in the space um, but also just to the general population to see like okay they're more than just what everyone thought it was um so Last week, we talked about the transition from level four to three to two uh, here in New Zealand and then what that's going to look like for your everyday athlete, uh, as well as those who are trying to get into the fitness space, as well as those who are performing at a high level. Uh, Now that we're looking at the level three to the level two, when people can start moving back into gyms and whatnot, um, there are going to be those uh, few people who do want to take it a little bit more seriously. Now, There's a lot of content out there already that we touched on last week of just a a massive saturation. And there's also going to be, I see this moment as potentially similar to new year, new me, right? We come out of lockdown, all these people like, oh, that whole time I wasn't very active or I wasn't as active as I should have been. Uh, So I'm just going to go ham and get back into it. So we kind of talked about um, properly spreading load and managing fatigue as we do get into it. But Personally, and I guess for the rest of us, the best ideas uh, or the best management tool, I guess, to be able to help us through is to hire a PT or a coach. Now, obviously, this is a very biased view because we are all either a PT or a coach. We do deal with either individuals or teams, and we obviously studied in this area to make people to help people move more or move better in some way or form. Now, it's easy for us to say, we think that you should get uh, coaches or whatnot, but it's a very biased perspective. So what we're going to do is we're going to give our perspectives based on what other people had given us and saying why it is that they don't hire coaches. So we've put everything together, turned it into questions, and now this is our time to give back our rebuttals so we're just going to kick straight into it Uh, i talked about the saturation of content now online basically anyone can become a chef Uh, they can also become uh, anything that you really want to (laughs) anything that you really want to um, with anything that's online content is everywhere youtube you can become a trainer Uh, you can start to train people straight away now if we can learn all of this online why then is it important to get a coach or um, why is it that I should hire this person and use some of my money, which is a resource when I can just use other, these uh, other free resources online. So Fraser, I'm going to get you to kick off there, my man. Yeah, good. Good brother. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very interesting thing that we're moving into with the, the online training paradigm. And I think that in general, yes, people could use online coaching resources, but there is a, a big difference between connecting with someone face-to-face and getting cues uh, through a screen. I think one of the best analogies I can think of is my year 12 maths teacher who... who was also the vice principal, so he had a lot of stuff going on and he was never really present in class. He didn't really care about teaching mathematics and I was going into the exams looking like I was gonna fail. I had the head of math in half an hour who's extremely passionate and engaged with mathematics uh, connect with me and teach me a few things and he literally helped me pass two papers within half an hour. Um, If you wanted to, go in depth and understand why that is so important, like the ability to connect face to face. You can look into bioenergetics and understand that the passion that 
we as coaches and trainers have that we've built up over you know many years knowing that training is a spectrum and it takes a, a very long time to get uh, bodily awareness and an understanding of uh, whatever technique or form of you know movement pattern or skill that uh, you're trying to learn, it does take a little bit more than just hearing a cue through a screen. Um, yeah, it's it's so so because it's going to be it's going to be an interesting shift as we see more and more people do this and the digital platforms are growing. But yeah, I think you're never going to be able to beat the connection that you have face to face and knowing that like we called personal trainers it's not necessarily just physical training you're you happen to sculpt uh, an idea an ideology uh, you know, the routines the habits everything that creates an optimal um you know position to live from you know relating to health so yeah like what do you think Joey? um well, yeah, like you nailed a few of the main key points about it purely. Like, uh, I think one of the biggest things is like the trust of knowing who the knowledge is coming from. Purely like, not saying having an online coach or anything like that is going to be a negative experience or anything like that. It's good that you use the word optimal because it just might not be as beneficial as what it could be. Because when you are having that personal aspect of a personal trainer, someone that is there in the same physical zone as you, um, there are a lot of little um, form, forms of body language that someone can actually pick up and everything like that. Purely like, because um, you're talking along like the whole online resources and everything. Like, because I just think back to, it sounds funny, but using myself as an example, like when I was about, 13, 14, come from a small town and uh, got introduced to going into the gym with my older brothers. One, the first thing I did was I went on to Google and just looked up um, how to do exercises properly. There are plenty of websites out there that um, help you and um, plenty of uh, well, different exercise variations. And I feel you can easily become a little bit too overwhelmed with everything that's coming at you. So as a way of having a personal trainer to actually full to the knowledge or the information that is getting put towards the uh, individual purely just because um, well even if you read any scientific study they always give a optimal time frame of ways of um, when adaptations should occur and usually you do get a little bit uh, frustrated when that doesn't actually happen or anything like that so it's having someone alongside you highlighting points of why it may be happening or may not be it's just a whole huge factor like that so also having a coach that is in the same uh, discipline as what the athlete is because I know for example not in a bad way, but I have had athletes at the school that I work with, Otago Boys, drop me as their uh, strength coach and go towards someone that's more experienced in their discipline, such as cycling. Um, and like I hold no angst against that purely just because I know that is going to be more beneficial from them to have a better uh, grasp of the knowledge that's getting passed through and everything else like that. Um, yeah, like there's a lot of different things that you can go on about, but um, yeah, I guess that's uh, one area that I like to put on through there. Yeah, that's a, those those are both really good points. You know, you highlight the human aspect of everything, which you can't really get. Um, I guess if you are working through a screen, and then for the online resources, it is definitely a very overwhelming. Um, I guess area, especially if it's something that you're trying to get into for the first time. Um, and you know, we have information, a lot of information out there, which usually people would say knowledge is power. But in this case, how do you actually decipher what is the right knowledge for you? So it only becomes powerful when the, when it can be applied properly in context. Um, so, you know, because we have sometimes we have people who say do A, B, C, and then you have people say do X, Y, Z. Um, now they're both optimal, but only optimal when, applied with the right constraints i guess um did anyone else have any other you know any other points that they'd like to add on because this is a really good this is something that we come across quite often where people are like i don't need you i can just learn that and 
like so how do you how would you not no no other points it takes yeah, yeah, a lifetime to it. learn yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah look yeah. jump in yeah no um i was going to elaborate it on my point but um, it's just that human element um, that Fraser was talking about. We're not going to sit here and lie and say you can't get a program online because you can. Um, there's, there's a thousand of them. Um, but what you pay for is things beyond that. Uh, relationships, accountability, um, having a personal conversation with them. Um, just that human element. Um, I mean, we're sitting here right now talking. It's not going to be the same as being in the same room. Um, there's something maybe even spiritual around it, actually being present. Um, it's, it's a lot more powerful, but I just think that having that human element um, and that real time queuing, um, personalized queuing, you know, it might, they might not understand um, weight on heels and you might be able to change that then and there. Um, whereas they need to go back online that night, send the email through, get back in 24 hours, righty right. You know what I mean? It's, it's not that instant um, feedback. Um, but beyond that, I think accountability, um, friendship, relationships, um, asking how their son is, how's work, that sort of stuff is, is deeper. Yeah, yeah 100%. Like, um, 100%. Yeah. Because um, as yeah, like what uh, Luke mentioned there, it's like even just having a conversation about the personal life and everything like that, is you can actually start to dig into identifying what other stresses that they may have, have within their um or the lifestyle that could be like maybe causing a road roadblock to progression or anything else like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think uh, a, a real good thing about that as well, when you mentioned um, like the immediate queuing uh, without having to relay information back um, at a later date is it's quite good to understand what language you should use immediately with a client, because a lot of times you can be as scientific and, use the as professional dialogue as what you want. But if you don't actually have the individual understanding the message that you're trying to get across, you, you, you're going to be getting nowhere and everything else like that. 100%. Uh, uh, oh, go, go Ronnie. Um, I think it, a lot of it comes down to the personality of, of the person and um, it's something they need to identify with themselves. I know that people, some people who are very intrinsically motivated can just be given a program and they'll they'll go do it no problems whereas other people they need the the connection the relationship the encouragement and that makes it more enjoyable for them so like for myself i, I can just be given a program and and i'm sweet i'm gonna do it um whereas i know my mum who's just written in the comments over here she needs someone to you know be pushing her through it you know engaging conversation not just about training but She'll definitely want to talk about stuff outside of training as well. So you've got to identify what are your needs and what sort of uh, motivates you. Yeah, no, all, all very good points. And uh, just another thing that we kind of, uh, I guess with online resources, and I, it's not just in the space of health and fitness as well, it's in any space, but really uh, what does happen when you don't know how to decipher any information uh, the first thing that does happen is that if you want to coach yourself or you want to learn all these things, um, you, you don't have differing perspectives, right? You don't have someone else who can give you a second hand uh, or a second look at things. And what tends to happen is we have that confirmation bias. So we'll always look for evidence. That's great. But we'll look for evidence that suits what we want to do. And we never actually get any better because we're always just like, nah, 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 I don't want to do that because, and then you have, you have so many answers, but it's only because you've found the evidence that works best for you. So having that second look by someone who's coming at it with an objective lens, I guess in that case, now, you've talked about the human element, you've talked about the personalities, you've talked about um, being able to provide the right context or provide the right services. Wow. It sounds like coaches are more than just the person who you show up to uh, and tells you, you know, oh, okay, we're doing so-and-so reps of this exercise, and then we're moving over to that exercise. Um, so what really is, from your eyes, the job of the coach or the personal trainer, because it sounds like there's a lot that they can be. Facilitate Any? growth. You want to elaborate? Yeah, man, like, 
the whole idea of training the body is not just training the body. The, the mental aspect of when you're training is just as important. People think that they're training the, the physical body and yet if they're completely uh, disengaged mentally, they have no chance of engaging the right muscles. You get told a cue online and you think you're performing the cue, you think you're doing it, and yet the coach can see that you're still hyper excessively uh, using your lower back instead of the glutes. You know, There's a disconnect. And that's when the, the face-to-face is truly valuable. Nice. Just feel free to jump, jump in when you, feel, when you get a gap. I think an, an important part of our jobs is to educate our athletes or, or clients that we're working with. You know, there's that saying, you know, give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day, teach him how to fish. Mm-hmm. Well, they're not going to train with you forever. And um, you want to equip them with school, uh, skills and tools so that when it comes to a time when you're not around or they move somewhere else, they can sort of pick up where they left off and continue to train and make progress when you're not around. So I think that's one of the signs of a, of a successful person. They're sort of sewing into that person, um, their client, not just you know, limiting their not their their input so that they just keep coming, you know. Yeah. And they're just just a paycheck. You want to be, you know, grow, um, going into them so that they're growing you as a person. And totally. Um, and I mean, this sounds really weird to come from you know professionals in this area, but a a good sign or a really good knowledge of um uh, of our success is the fact that these people don't need us anymore because we've given them so much that they can literally go off and do their own thing. They've become empowered to be able to like take control of their own growth, I guess. Now that sounds, it sounds so weird because they're just like, wait, aren't you just putting yourself out of business? But that's just the type of people that we are. And I I a hundred percent agree with what you're saying there, Ronnie and the re-education because you know, health and fitness is a really weird space where people do come to you with, uh, they already have preconceived ideas of what it is. Um, and sometimes, you know, we don't want to tell them they're wrong. We just, you know, there's some things that, Oh, you, you know, these things could be done better and you might have a, like a greater longevity and quality of life as well. Um, no, really, really good points there. Luke, Luke you look like you're rearing to go, mate. No, I, I'm, I'm just reiterating what Ronnie said. Um, I think our main role is to educate, um, and the broad spectrum of fitness and health. Uh, it could be anything and trying to isolate some red flags that they may be presenting, whether it's nutritional or uh, through their mental um, fortitude or anything like that, um, through education. Um, One of the first things that I do say when I have a consultation is I'm not here to motivate you. You guys signed up to the gym by yourself without me even being a part of your life. I'm here to educate you um, and see where we can get to. But um, I think, yeah, definitely education. That's what we can instill some of our IP to them. That's our role, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, was a. I was gonna say yeah. Like it's all. It's a. It's a mixture of things that we. Um, that kind of make up a like a coach and all that kind of stuff. Like one thing that I like to think of most is uh, you got to be pretty um, selfless to actually be a uh, like personal trainer or strength coach or anything like that because, like the amount of it's actually a bit of a tricky profession to be in purely if you are well kind of not contracted to a professional team or anything because you are out there doing early mornings late nights yeah putting in a lot of hard yakka just to um well try bringing that paycheck not that that's everything but it is a means to live but like you have to be pretty unselfish in the way you do things like um like you're using analogies like before like um one thing i always think about is because, well, my brother's a builder, but it's always like a builder's house. You're there, you're out there to build other people up, help people feel and look the way that they want to, that sometimes it may not be, well, kind of like optimal for yourself, but you get that kind of self-gratitude coming back that you feel a little bit more, well, reinforced in those kind of ways. And um, 
one thing that like I have taken up this year, which I've actually really enjoyed, is um, f- through the high school building a relationship with the um, Otago Polytech, which um, I have actually started to kind of, aside from a coach role or anything like that, but this is a tricky little industry to get into. And I didn't really have a mentor as I got into it, but to actually provide mentorship to those other postgraduate students that are coming through, I've actually started to feel like a lot of, um, well, gratitude coming back from there. And it's actually quite cool because like I've got like a three to four guys that I'm helping out, uh, bringing up to school, getting our uh, work experience and everything else like that. So it's, there's a lot of different ways that you can um, be more active and involved in this role. And you just got to open up your own doors in those kind of ways. Well, it sounds like it's the, the constant education, I guess. And like, we're not only teaching these people, but by the sounds of like any sort of mentorship or uh, any sort of role where you get to develop yourself as well, you're also getting that feedback um, and you're developing yourself as you go. But I, I totally agree. It's exactly what we kind of keep coming back to is that we're just very selfless uh, in this industry. And um, that brings us to our next point, which is, you know, being selfless, which is, so I guess last week we kind of touched on the shakeup in commercial fitness where um, memberships from that, you know, that 10 to $20 price range, you know, that the, that's that kind of point where people will pay, but don't necessarily show up because they don't see it as much of an investment. It's like, I have this membership, but I don't, you know, it's just in case I want to go. It's not at that point yet where um, I'm investing in my health. And now this one, I'm just setting up for Luke to smack out of the park. But I think a lot of it, um, a lot of the, I guess the ideas or the biggest barrier that a lot of people see to why they wouldn't hire a coach or sometimes not even get into physical activity in general and this is in uh, worldwide literature uh, the main barrier is cost right there's a perceived cost barrier and that is why a lot of people don't even try to step foot into this and they'll have that excuse prior to even thinking about engaging so how is it that you would attack this because I'm pretty sure Luke you've had someone come up to you and just say I'd love your services but I can't afford it or ah it's a bit pricey don't you think how do you handle that situation Luke yeah well on the ladder you have to drop your ego um and not um but I think it does come back to not devaluing yourself um but my two major points what well, I'll start with the story so when I first started training sort of 17 18 um who do I go to? Obviously the biggest guy in the gym. Um, you know, can I train with you? Um, and potentially still paying for it today, um, around training load and, and stuff like that. Um, maybe lead me down the wrong pathway with, with volume or incorrect exercises. Um, but who was I to know? Um, so I guess for me, um, it's a tricky one because I feel that, a concept that does resonate is you're not, you're not paying me for my time right now. You're paying me for the seven years that I've just spent studying. Uh, you're, you're paying me for the 70 grand loan that I've got. Um, you're paying me for the IP that we studied late nights for. Um, that's a, a concept that I, I do like. Um, and, and on the same thing with, with another quote, um, if, if you think it's expensive to hire a professional, try hire an amateur. Um, my, my ideas around that is, uh, I would rather you spend a hundred dollars on a very high quality trainer for one session than spend $50 twice on a low quality trainer. Uh, I would rather see you save money for a month and go see the best trainer for one hour and, and pick their brains for an hour and rather than get three $40 sessions or two $50 sessions any day. Um, the amount of education you're going to get from him or her um, is going to be tenfold. Um, so yeah, I guess having that concept of not devaluing yourself is really, really important um, because uh, they will barter with you. Um, there's no doubt. And they may even say, you know, I'm going to go try what you've taught me already. Um, that's a big one. You know, you take them through a free session and they say, uh, yeah, sweet. I'm going to go do that. And you literally see them repeating that session five times a week. Um, 
and you know you do leave them to it and you you might revisit it but i think um and final concept for me um your health is your wealth um i think it's a very generic uh term uh, phrase sorry but um i i firmly believe in it I, I have no issue spending money on my health um buying high quality food i think my my concept around that is you you pay for it now or you pay for it later um and that's not to scare anyone or anything like that um but if you if you make that decision to prioritize your health early um it's going to save you money in the long term around your health um and 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 that but i, I think not, yeah once again not to scare anyone but i i do think that your health is your wealth and and prioritizing your, your health and fitness and and uh food choices and things like that um but yeah i, I do think it, it certainly has its place Man, that was is spot on and you know I, I sit here and just you know i'm just like oh you're agreeing with all my points and i'm like wait why i need something to challenge me now but that's um you talked about so dewey's points about being selfless and then you talking about not devaluing yourself which i think is one of the hardest things especially for the people here i look around at all of you and you've just been giving out free content for years and now it's like how do you get to that point where uh, your dollar or a dollar value is kind of you're so overworked but you're so happy to be overworked and still get underpaid so I think it's even now trying to you know kind of see that value in yourselves and um, just uh, on a few of the points where you touched on uh, the health is your wealth and we're looking at preventative measures as well yes exercise will be there when things do go wrong but like you were saying it is like at least quadfold the difficulty trying to get people back into something when they've been you know taken out and they didn't need to be taken out so always you know and always stopping them at the top of the cliff before having to put the ambulance down at the bottom um ricky or do you have any points on the whole cost thing like i know your setup is a little bit different because uh you don't really have the one-to-one -one people paying you but is there anything that you had in mind for this one uh, not too much. It was just more of a, um, you know, like you give out free content with the idea of, okay, we'll give them one program. And then after that, you know, we'll, we'll try and sell them a, a second program. Maybe they'll pay for it. And it's that, or even maybe you just say oh, giving out programs, and, but there is a little cost involved. And it's kind of funny the amount of people that just go radio silence, you know, as soon as there's some kind of cost involved to actually let them pay to use your service. It's like, no, it's that free. Give, uh, take, take, take. Mm. Um, yeah, but I suppose I am a little bit different in the terms that I, I do PT, but I've only got one or two clients and it's not my base, my main salary. So I'm still kind of lucky in that regard, I think. Yeah. Uh, I think just, oh, sorry. Um, you, you go for, I was just, we got one more point um, on this one and then we'll come back to you, Luke. But we've just had a, a really good um, suggestion in the comments actually about... Um, so I guess in terms of this one, it would be trying to find, it's more on the last question, but say, you know, there are options available where maybe people don't quite know what it is a good coach or a good trainer is. Um, so how is it that we can actually give them that little taste or, um, you know, start to see if it is something worth putting into their budget. I'm sorry, we, we get to the entire question in the last uh, little section, but have you ever thought about that? I mean, there are the free weeks and whatnot, but how about just having blocks first where you can start to give your value? Because we've talked about, you know, what it is a good coach is, and maybe it's just that people can't see the initial value. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. With, yeah. with Snap, so we, we give two free sessions um, for every uh, sign-up that happens. So for me, the way I run it, I have an initial consultation. Um, figure out what do you want, what's your issues, what's stopping you, how can I facilitate those changes? And in the second session, I try deliver uh, a high quality physical session. Um, and in, in, in that time, try sell what I, what value I may be able to provide. Um, and if I don't go do a good job, then that's on me. Um, but yeah, I guess giving a little bit, um, but also giving and not, expecting something back i think and being genuine with it is going to be more powerful than oh i gave you two free sessions why don't you sign up um mm -hmm. i think being authentic with that 
Um, but yeah, we do give two mandatory uh, free sessions um, to hopefully, um, I mean, even if they don't sign up and even from a genuine perspective, hopefully we can provide enough value to get them underway. And then uh, if in a month's time they're struggling, they go, hmm, that guy helped me. Maybe I'll go catch up with him. Um, hopefully that's something that crosses their mind. You know, it, uh, Luke gave me a free program or he talks to me um, during, you know, when he's walking the floor and, and spots me or giving some genuine free time um, will come back. Um, and I think they do respect that. Very good point. Very, very good point. Um, so I guess now moving on, it's it's a nice segue into our next part. And I think this is something that we can probably stay on for a while. Uh, and I'm happy to stay here for a while because there's a lot that's packed into this question. So um, I guess something that brought us all together was from the stuff that we were sharing and it was kind of just looking at how the industry is shaping out as it is and just who has the loudest voice. It doesn't, it's not really the people uh, who can give some really valuable insight. Um, it's those who, you know, probably aren't really, as Luke said, authentic in there. A lot of it is because, you know, they're, they're running a brand, they're running a business. Now we can also run brands. We can also be a business, but I think the values or your intrinsic motivations for why you do things are a little bit different from those who are just there to make a quick buck. Um, so with that said, we know that this industry kind of plays into the psychology of people and the psychology of people is that, you know, we want to do something that doesn't hurt much, won't take long and gives me the best results ever. And now we have people who literally promise that to people. They're like, Oh, you've come to the right place. In six weeks, you just pay me this much. We'll get you looking like something you've never looked like before. And then there's no follow up. There's no care in that time. It's literally just getting them in and just trying to get some really good churn. So we're in an industry that is largely profit driven. Um, and I guess from this, a lot of people do have trust issues. Now, like, they see PTs, they see coaches as all just one in the same, right? One contaminates the water. Now everyone's drinking from that same water and we're all the same people. So how is it that we can actually start to, I guess, regain that trust in people or how is it that you yourself would start to, you know, show people this is not actually what we do. Or if you are trying to find a trainer, these are the things I'd look for, like the certain, uh, I guess, qualifications or their experiences uh, or even their, you know, the value that they can provide. What are the some things that are like a trademark good coach in your eyes? So Ricky, if you want to kick us off. Yep. So I just got my, my wee point. I do your due diligence and shop around. So I kind of see that if you're, if you're going to buy a car, you're going to buy a house, you're not just walking down the road bang, that's the house I'm going to go go to. Or, you know, like Luke says, maybe it's that you're, you're signing up at the gym and you get given Pete as your um, free session. So bang, I'm going to go with him. Now he's done my two sessions. If that wasn't quite that connect. So I kind of said, look, looking for things that you're, you're looking for is your exp the experience. So um, although an uh, amateur or fresh coach, which um, in terms of coaching years, we, we are, I suppose. Um, you want to make sure that they've worked with people similar to, to what you're looking for. Or if they're not, you're, then you're asking questions. So the next one is knowledge. So ask them questions. Try and catch them out and see what they actually know. Can they actually answer it in layman's terms to you? Or are they going to try and give you an answer that you can't understand and make themselves sound smart? Um, a wee example I had written down here is probably a shit yarn, but we'll go with it. Um, my mate, one of my flatmates went to a PT um, just out, out of school. Um, went to him and said he'd done a bit of research around why he thought his uh, squat wasn't very well. And he went to his PT and said, I think my squat's not very good because my hips are tight. The PT watched him squat and said, yeah, hips are tight. We'll work on that. Four, five, six months later, he's still terrible. Um, I think this must have been like a year later. He said this, told the this, told this story to me and I said, right, do a squat. And straight away I was like, bang, okay, you've got long ass legs, try a front squat, try and just really staying tall, engage, ready, ra. Bang. So it's that, that knowledge of around not just the exercises, bang, sets, reps, boom. It's that how is it being done, where are we feeling it, that, that connection like everyone's talking about when we're talking about back on stuff online. So it's that extra little cue. And then the biggest point is are they a decent person? So you're going to be spending time with this person. Um, are they inspiring? Are they going to teach you along the way? Or are they just worried about that, that dollar? 
Um, I've worked at a, a couple of gyms where a guy is literally playing online poker while he had a client. And that shit just blows my mind and I was struggling, I couldn't get clients. So that, that was a real kick in the teeth. Um, yeah, it's just, you want a human, you want someone that you're going to have a chat to, you can actually become friends with and open up to, and they're going to teach you along the way, like, like we've been talking about. And then the last one, don't assume someone who's ripped with big muscles is a good coach slash trainer. There's much more to PTing than uh, looking good. Uh, yeah, cheers. Ronnie's pretty ripped, and he's a good coach, so... Oh, yeah, oh, there's, there's definitely a happy medium. You know? <laughs> 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 I've got a few points on this one, actually. Um, I think at the end of the day, you want to uh, find a coach who, one, you'll get along with, um, but then, two, they're going to get you the results that you, that you want. Um, and there's definitely quite a few factors um, to consider. Um, one of them will be the experience. Like where have they worked previously? How long have they been doing this? Um, you know, have they got experience working um, under some top trainers? Have they been mentored? You know, like, I guess we're young, we're not considered to be very experienced, but um, two, two of us have worked with super rugby teams. I've worked with, you know, international rugby. So that, that counts for something as well. Um, also like their qualifications, and whilst qualifications aren't everything, um, you know, they do indicate a level of, I guess, intellect and, uh, you know, ability to think critically, especially once you get to the postgraduate level. Um, in saying that, though, some people are so book smart. Um, I know of a master's student who didn't know how to run a warm up. You know, they spend so much time. Uh, reading in the books um, and they're not getting practical experience um, it's a bit useless really unless they want to go down the whole research side of things um, so don't you you got to consider both qualifications and experience you want to consider um, does this coach or trainer specialize in a certain area like we all have our areas of interest um, somebody might be into you know body composition bodybuilding weight loss type stuff some people, um, some trainers will be into, you know, speed power development. Others are into rehab um, and injury management. Um, and you definitely want to select a trainer whose, um, you know, skill set um, aligns with what you're trying to achieve. Uh, what else have I got here? Um, and most importantly, you, you want to know that they're, they're getting results. Um, talk to the, to the people that they train, their clients. Are they happy with, um, you know, the value that their, their coach is providing? Um, are their clients sticking around? Like if you have a trainer and his clients only last one or two months and then they go off somewhere else, then that's a bit of a red flag. But if they've got people who are loyal, then it shows that, okay, this guy actually, uh, you know, provides value to his uh, clients. Another one um, is uh, with the results, are, are their clients getting injured? Um, and I think potentially this is more um, related to strength and, and conditioning coaches. Um, if your athletes are getting a lot of injuries, then there might be something you're not doing properly. Um, so again, that, that's, that's a red flag. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, like, like uh, was mentioned before, you, you need to be a good person. Um, if, if you don't- Gonna be on TV. If you don't vibe with the, with the trainer and you know, get along with them, then you're in for a rough ride. And like our uh, former lecturer, Matty Blair used to say, you just need to be a good bugger. Matty <laughs> um, But yeah, like, you, you, you can find, find anyone who can say that they can train people, but you know, at the end of the day, any idiot can make someone tired. Um, you want someone who knows what they're doing. Are they targeting specific energy systems? Are they periodizing properly? Are they um, prioritizing recovery? Are they educating you? These are all things that, uh, it's probably a lot, a lot that I've said, but um, you know, different considerations to, to take into account when, when choosing someone. Really good points. Really good points. 
Um, just to just to wrap up the first two, and then we'll move around uh, to the rest of you. But the um, I think we touched on it multiple times. But every time someone is coming to you with their you know their physical, I guess, but also mental aspirations of how they're going to go forward in a certain like a, a, I guess an area that's not really comfortable with them, they are being vulnerable with you. And if you don't have that human element, you can really like burn this person for the rest of their life. Where they come in because they trust in you, like oh, you will actually help me be better. And then if you're like Ricky's example is like oh no, nah, yeah, tight hips, and then you make them believe for the rest of their lives, like, oh, I can't squat, got tight hips, no, never again, I can't do it. I, and now you've just taken that opportunity away from them to actually become better because you didn't um, do any, like, do your job properly, really. Um, another thing is the churn that you were talking about, like, how long are these people staying around? Like, are they running something that's sustainable here? Is it something where people actually enjoy being with you, A, but also they're not getting hurt because you're properly periodizing them, you're properly listening to them if they're saying, oh, I don't know, I don't know why this is happening. And you're like, nah, it's because you're soft, right? So like, all those things that come in and that, that, that's that old school mentality that people think if you do come in to be a trainer, that's how you have to be with while you're wearing your matching tracksuit. Um, and another thing with you talking about looking for the biggest person, you know, a lot of their biases come into the training. Like sometimes you can be in a gym and you can see people moving around and you're like, Oh man, Mr. X, Y, Z trains that person. Cause that's what he does. And then they just like, give all their training to these people because they think it's the right thing to be doing all the time. So you, you're exactly right. They, you know, they're thinking critically the whole time. Now, Dewey, I think you were going to be jumping in. Uh, yeah, man. Um, was like, I found um, one of the topics that uh, Ronnie uh, was it picked on there, like, was it's very interesting about the qualifications and everything like that, because like, well, it's one thing that's um, quite heavily promoted in some areas of uh, kind of going through and getting your um, S&C accreditations with like, let's say, um, the um, Australian Strength and Conditioning Association or even how now the local um, um, Sport and Exercise Science New Zealand um, organisation is uh, offering it as well. And I think it's quite, well, it's quite good looking at the way that they have their level structures of like one, two, three, and like as you progress through those, it gives um, a little bit more of like a badger on us saying that you're a more advanced practitioner compared to um, those at the levels uh, below you or anything like that. Um, it is one of those things where most SNCs, especially the well, old dogs nowadays that are in control of um, kind of other professional teams and stuff like that they don't actually have these accreditations so it's one of those uh factors where you look at them and you say well old john doesn't have his um senz level one snc cert so why should i and it kind of creates that little bit of a feedback loop of saying is it really necessary until it actually comes into uh, uh actual requirement for jobs which it is kind of one of those things now uh it's kind of quite funny when you think along like the whole qualification side of it purely because one thing that I always think of is the whole um, way that you differentiate a nutritionist to a dietitian what that can, well anyone can use the label nutritionist unfortunately and in an Instagram bio a Facebook page or anything like that but it's when you actually progress progress into being a dietitian you actually have to go through a whole um undergraduate degree do a two-year postgraduate with um what was it like doing theses work placements in three different uh, areas within the community and all that kind of stuff so it's actually quite funny to see where those distinctions are made it is kind of one of those ones that uh, finding those qualifications can help to choose a coach or anything but it just kind of comes into what you're actually looking for um and yeah like one thing that uh but only uh, said as well was like um, any average Joe can come in and run you for a session and uh, run you absolutely into the ground. Like let's just say for a, a speed work, um, trying to like target the appropriate energy system. And if, well, for example, like if you're trying to target your high end maximal uh, speed development and you're coming out of an absolutely shagged running, uh, let's just say 20 reps of a 400 meter pitch. Like that's when you start to actually to think like is it actually necessary 
a good thing that I quite like to encourage uh, people to do, especially, um, well, kind of being in the school system and they have to go through the NCEA uh, courses of developing their own programs is you encourage them to research what their sport requirements are and just the basics of um, how to achieve it and like that way it's uh, going back to the educational thing of you actually empower them to become more selective of what they're actually looking for like to have a smarter athlete or someone that can understand uh, your methods of madness it's actually going to be one of the most beneficial things that you can have and I guess that's uh, was it when you actually start to work in those high performance areas you're really beneficial for it because it's your passion it's their passion but it's a little bit more harder when you are in that uh, general, uh, was it layperson, general pop area that makes it a bit more uh, harder. Mm. Yeah. Um, Just jumping. Sweet, I'm going. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit left field, but I think I saw I saw a study come out the other day um, assessing uh, consumer and uh, behaviour. Um, particularly around personal trainers and the results were unfortunately that um, the customer does lean towards the the trainer that is that is in good condition um, so it is what it is so we I guess us as trainers either need to be in good nick um, or be really really good at selling um, because if we're not we're just not gonna um, we're gonna be invisible um, it doesn't matter how intelligent we are or how good we are at, at making block periodization or, or speed programs or anything. If we can't sell ourselves, um, we're going to be up shit creek. And I also think that we do have some obligation to be in some kind of physical condition. Um, and I'm not saying you have to be ripped to shreds, but um, it's like Ronnie, um, but it's certainly going to help um, being in some kind of condition um, because I guess it's around that empathetic type of, of um, aspect that you do know what it's like to be in the trenches, you do know what it's like to train um, stuff like that I do think it has its element but it's not the be all end all but if you're, if you're not getting clients um, and, you're, and you are intelligent and you are um, obviously in good condition then it's this, this that sales element and unfortunately in, in gen pop and commercial gyms it is a huge part of it I know myself um, you know with a university background I was um, uh, being in the gym that I am there was a, a trainer that was there that had only done a, an online um, uh, education and he was killing it and rather than you know reflecting on myself and feeling sorry for myself um it's like okay well what is he doing that i'm not doing um because i've got more accreditation um you know i've been to uni um but he's better at selling so i mean if you can't sell yeah you're just going to struggle in this industry it's just part of it i think just to add on to you uh you know being in good condition it shows that we're, we have walked the talk mm. uh, in what we're preaching, you know, advocating uh, one, a healthy lifestyle, but a love for, for exercise and, and improving our own performance. Um, yeah. I know f for myself, working with uh, big rugby players, um, I like the fact that, you know, I can compete with them with some stuff, you know, in the gym, like, they're struggling with some pull-ups, then you go up next to them and crank them out, and you know, it it encourage encourage you encourage each other in a way. Um, whereas, if you have no physical capacity to, to do anything, they they might not respect you as much. Like that, uh, it's it's tough. It's tough, but you know, that's, that's reality. And um, like I, I I follow a lot of people on Instagram and. I'm not too worried exactly what they look like, but if they can do some pretty freakish stuff, you know, like if someone can nail a one hand, one hand pull up or they've got like ridiculous mobility or, you know, can go from not being able to dunk to dunk, I'm like, okay, that's, that's something that I'm, I wanna follow this person because I'm, I'm interested in, in what they're doing. You know, so if we can grow our own strengths, um, 
you know, people will, will want to follow and, and learn from us. Yeah, 100%, man. If you can show competency, it's just like you said, like, if a trainer is practicing what they're preaching and you know it doesn't happen overnight, you know it doesn't take six weeks, it takes a long time to build up capacity for the different skills and, uh, you know, whatever types of training attributes you're looking to build. It's, um, it does make sense. Like, you, like, for a person looking to invest in their health, it makes sense to... Uh, gauge the gauge the room and be like okay who can who can do what i want to do or like what am i wanting to achieve i'm going to go talk to that person yeah and i think one thing that we haven't mentioned is also like we need to be able to competently demonstrate the lifts mm. backflip <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If, you're not, if you're not in shape to be able to you know teach a person how to deadlift or clean or you know some of the more complex stuff then you know that's something that you need to work on yourself, in my opinion. Yeah. And that's especially like if we're talking like a, um, a first session with someone or like a consultation and you go and step in and they see you're all over the show, they're going to then question you. So it, it is judging a book by its cover because you're saying, okay, this guy can't do it. doesn't mean you can't explain it, but it's definitely going to be part of that thought process around, okay, I'm going to go somewhere else or I'm not going to bother with this after the session. Yeah having an understanding of consumer behavior and, and psychology and why they select what they select. I think it's, an, it's, it's just part of it. Um, and it's the same for S and C too. Um, climbing through the S and C ranks, you need to be able to sell yourself and what you're good at and um, blow your own horn. Like we spoke about last time, but um, there's, there's a huge element of understanding psychology. Hey? Do we, you were going to chime in? Um, yeah, I was after what Ricky said. I was gonna say it just reminds me of a uh, back to um, a practical that we did through one of the PE papers. I think uh, Ricky was in this um, stream of mine. It was an um, exercise rehab one with uh, Pete Gallagher, and um, was a he just said that one thing that he always does is he to do with his uh, exercise demonstration is he always makes sure that he has a pant wears pants that are flexible enough that he can do a pistol squat in purely just because it might be his own party trick or anything like that but he knows that it was his own way of subconsciously showing us that for an old dude well should I say that he um was a, is able to um was a still demonstrate a pretty complex lift in anything oh well movement or anything like that uh showing pretty well key physical attributes and yeah it's just pretty funny like that Uncle Pete. <laughs> no, it's uh, quite interesting things you guys are all touching on. And it's uh, it's one of those things where in our head, we kind of like, we, we just know that humans, ourselves included, because we are humans, are just emotionally driven. And uh, we go to what appeals to us the most, not necessarily makes the most sense or is the most logical, but the things that are going to appeal the most. And what appeals, the people that look like what we want to look like, the people that can do what we want to do, and the people who just like uh, can promise us that in the shortest, uh, most painless way possible, we will get to where we want to get to. Uh, that's what's going to appeal to us the most. So um, that's wrapped us up our four questions for now. If you guys had anything you wanted to check out now, this is your chance to. Otherwise, any final points from the floor? I was just going to mention, um, Luke, I need to chat to you about, um, you know, knowing your value. Because at the moment, I'm doing some low-key PTing on the side here. <laughs> and... Um, I'm definitely not charging as as much as I should be, but yeah, it's finding that balance. You know, what demographic are you working with? Um, like, why why are you even doing this sort of thing? But um, I th I think that's really important when when you're doing it to make a living. Yeah, you can't you know undersell yourself. You've got to know your worth. It's it's really really hard, and it's something that's probably taken me two and a half years, three years to actually develop. Um, we are in this industry to help people. So we come from that, that element of, man, I do this for free, bro. You know what I mean? I'd help you for free, but we need to put food on the table. So where can I find that middle ground? Um, it's really, really hard because like I said, you would literally help as many people as you can, if you could, um, like we are doing right now. Um, but 
there comes a point where um I mean maybe like for me I do I do look around at the other trainers and 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 acknowledge what they are charging and then also reflect back on my experiences and and my accreditations or quals and 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 then reflect on that and think okay well if they're charging this then I I do justify this um but then it does come back to like we have achieved quite a lot in quite a short amount of time I think all of us um I guess as a comparison to Man, the fitness industry is crazy, man. Like, you can do a three-month online course, no human contact, and be called a personal trainer. I find that crazy, but I'm going to go down a rabbit hole, so I'll stop there. But um, I, I think we do need to blow our own horn. Um, but I, I know your value, um, but find that middle ground um, around helping someone, um, and, but also putting food on the table. For, for me, I charge a certain amount um, for commitment, so I'll charge... Um, a certain rate for someone that commits for once a week and a, and a uh, slightly more and someone that commits twice a week slightly less because it's that commitment um, I'll charge less for a t uh, more for a two-month commitment and I'll charge less for a three-month commitment overall um, so that's how I sort of find that value but also um, something that I did learn over time is um, just that devalue if someone says oh can I can you do it for 80 just sacrifice that 80 bucks for your own value um, because they may come back um, and just, just find a set, set amount and just don't budge on it. Um, because if they're, if they're trying to devalue you, you might not, they might not be the client for you anyway. Um, it's that relationship um, and that money and that respect. Um, you wouldn't go to your doctor and say, Oh bro, can, can you do it for 40 bucks? Not 90. Um, it's the same thing. I think. It's such an interesting concept with the um when you talked about the going to the doctor where like you know we are professionals but people don't see us as professionals like you go to the dentist yeah. you pay the dentist and uh, like I want I want tooth help okay dentist oh yeah. I need a medication go to the doctor I need I've got a prescription now go to the pharmacist I want um I want work, I want help with my um with my training oh let's look on Instagram <laughs> like it's so it's so convoluted about who <laughs> people... just posted a booty workout let's go. <laughs> And it's like, um, and the, I guess the value and why the, the, the public don't perceive us as something to be, um, to, to, to be able to have those price points is because, you know, the fitness, commercial fitness industry in general just always had very low cost. Uh, and that low cost makes people think, oh, well, if I can pay $7 a week here, then that must be kind of the, the cost that it would be for me to maintain this. Why is this guy charging, you know, 40, 50 or upwards? Um, when most places like the small box gyms or the, the private institutions that, minimum $50 a week and those people who go there have the most like the best transformations they they stay there for so long because they've invested in their health so you talked about you know your health is a wealth and we're looking at everything in terms of investment so we're not talking the this is your one workout or this is my swipe workout do this um we're, we're talking how do we put this in the uh, or periodize it into the macro cycle which is life um we're not just look, looking you know week by week um so that's I guess, yeah, it's something that we're all kind of trying to deal with. And I guess as we're still trying to push through into it to establish ourselves, it'll be like there's a bit of barter back and forth between what we think is enough and then what we are uh, trying to please everyone else as well. So, you know, it's just that back and forth. And the more we do this, then the more we talk to each other, the more other people can talk to us. I think we can start to really solidify uh, where we stand in all of this. So uh, this is a question off the cuff. I just, in this week, this is our final one, quick fire around the room. Has there been any resource in the strength and conditioning or any sort of training or even uh, mental training that you have come across, whether it be Instagram, whether it be a webinar, whether it be something that's out there on the web for people to go to uh, that you would recommend just in the past week or even the past year that you haven't spoken about? Yeah, definitely. I feel like a lot of sort of organizations are doing more like webinar type stuff, um, you know, online presentations, which thankfully most of them are free on, on YouTube. Um, Ricky told me about a Statsport one uh, yesterday and I've been going through some of their um, YouTube videos. Uh, great if you're working with, with teams and you have access to GPS units. Um, and then I've also been going through some fusion sports stuff. 
looking at you know smarter base how to use that um which again is is more for the strength and conditioning elite team side but that's where i'm at at the moment i've really enjoyed uh learning those through those platforms I've been going in on a guy called Wayne Goldsmith. He's a, a master coach, you'd probably call him from Australia. He's worked with uh, predominantly swimming, but he's um, now a coach's coach. So he is on the NRL board of coaching and he goes around quite a lot of high profile teams and kind of upskills their coaches. Um, does some awesome stuff around um, the mental aspect associated with training. And um, especially at this time, like he talks about, I can't remember if I mentioned it last, last week, but I may have done bits around gymnastics athletes that are training four hours a day, five days a week, they've now gone through this period of doing nothing and they realise, oh shit, I didn't actually like doing that that much. Um, so he tried and talked about how we, how we can use, how we get that connection with people and that. So he talks about that. Um, his webinar series talks about parents that like how to create an environment to kind of bring up kids so you're not putting huge pressure on them. He talks about a whole, whole lot of stuff that's really good content, I reckon. Goldsmith. Wayne Goldsmith. Use my code, Ricky oh, yeah. Tins. <laughs> uh, bloody hell. Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, yeah, like, alongside, um, was it, um, was it, I, I could say, was it, uh, sorry, a way to get uh, good ideas and everything like that is, I say, I'll be a little bit guilty of it as well, but. Like there are the social media platforms like Instagram are really good for it because a lot of great coaches are actually quite um, well engaged with their social media and everything like that. Like there are actually quite a lot over in Aussie that do a real good job. Um, like because I'm just thinking of the one company. Um, I think we're all, all quite familiar with it, but the Athletes Authority. Like uh, what they do over there is some actually well. I, I find it quite awesome just using those um, was a uh, preparation drills, uh, just thinking outside of the box and just everything else like that. Uh, yeah, I guess that's just probably the only point they'll chuck in is like yeah, you, even as much as what the general pop may use Instagram and all that for, I must say it's a guilty pleasure of my own trying to go through and just shop for new ideas and everything. <laughs> uh yeah. Athletes Authority of Unreal, um, two good guys, uh, Lockie Wilmot and um, Carl Goodman. They, they, their content is unreal and it's free. It's um, They're probably one of the best. Um, another guy, um, Alex Sandalis. Um, so me and Ricky met him last year in Christchurch, came over with Christian Woodford. Um, so they ran a similar webinar like we're doing right here. I'd highly recommend all of you guys if you haven't seen it. So Orphic, O-R-P-H-I-C, Education. Um, they've done two, two and a half hour um, webinars um, discussing the industry, um, Unreal. Um, and another one is Veld Performance, I think, V-A-L-D, uh, with Alex Natera, Simon Thomas from the Crusaders. Um, some really, really intelligent um, trainers out there. Um, and once again, free. Um, and that's, I guess that's our industry in a nutshell. Eh? We do want to help each other out, um, particularly in, in difficult times. So, yeah, it's really, really cool. Nice. And uh, recently I've gone back to, did anyone do athletic injuries? I've like gone back to all my notes and that stuff. And I'm like, bro, this is still so relevant. Yeah. But like for those who didn't go and get the chance to meet old Neil Anderson and Mel Bussey. Um, a really cool, another cool paper to look into. So kind of on the philosophy side of things is uh, a paper called How to Unring the Bell. I'll, I'll put up the actual, I think it's an open access in a journal, but basically what it's about is um, it's a proper systematic review and a meta-analysis on how to uh, approach misinformation. Now, we know how we are, like, the first thing we see a bunch of bullshit all the time and we're like, call that out. But like um, this, what this paper looks at is how people have approached um, 
changing the minds of some people. And but this one's on like the the level of like politics and flat earthers. So hopefully, if they can start changing the way people perceive yeah. the the earth because it is flat, um, then maybe we could be able to you know change their minds around some of the training methodology uh, or nutrition that is out there. So. It's been another spectacular week, boys. Thank you so much for being on this week. Um, absolutely, just great content. Also, always great to catch up with you all. Um, if there's anything you wanted to leave us with before we gap, this is your time now. Otherwise, we are through. Uh, good. Uh, good. Bloody so, good. Bloody.